Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Now we know that God is holy, and because He's holy, He must judge sin. And there's two ways that God judges sin, one of which is through His grace by means of redemption that we talk about over and over, the most important truth in all of Scripture, and that is the redemption through the blood of Messiah, when He laid down His life upon that tree. But another way that God judges sin is through death, death of the sinner and the eternal torment that the sinner will have forever and ever. And what is the parameters of this judgment? That is to say, what does God use as the basis for judgment? Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about in today's message. So take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Revelation in chapter 15. The book of Revelation in chapter 15. Now, we have seen that God in the earlier chapters, He has pronounced judgment. We have seen some of His judgment in Revelations chapters 8 and 9. And now we're going to begin to see God's, not just His judgment, but His wrath poured out upon the world. We have seen how that is going to bring an end to Babylon, this evil empire in the last days. We have seen that God is going to place an angel that is appointed to place his sickle into the world and harvest them for the judgment of his, his press, his wine press, where his judgment will consume those who have no relationship with him. But again, how do we understand this judgment? Well, look with me, as I said, to Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. This 15th chapter is all for one purpose, and that is that we might understand the nature and the parameters, the definitions, the basis for God's judgment of this world. Verse 1 says this, And I looked, and another sign in the heavens, great and marvelous. Now, if we're talking about judgment, why would God use the word marvelous or wonderful to describe it? Well, remember what we talked about last week. It is because after God's judgment is poured out, His kingdom will be established. So judgment brings about a glorious, a wonderful outcome to it. Look again at verse 1. I looked and another sign in the heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels carrying the seven last plagues. Now, why use this term plague? Well, the word that we might think of is striking or a blow. It's very similar to the term that we find in the book of Exodus. In other words, God wants us to read in Revelation chapter 15 and understand there's a relationship between these seven final plagues and what we saw in the ten plagues in Egypt. And what is that? The outcome redemption. God brought his people out of bondage in Egypt. Remember, Egypt is symbolic of the world. He's going to bring us out of this world, which is seen in the book of Revelation as being paralleled with Babylon, Babylon, that great, that harlot. And also we see that that redemption is being referred to here as the basis for this transition from this age into the kingdom. And as we said, Unless there's judgment, that kingdom will not come. So he talks about the seven angels. Why seven? Well, seven has to do with being set apart for a purpose. Seven also has to do with holiness. So these angels are going to pour out the seven final plagues in order that God's purpose, His holiness, might be manifested in and through His kingdom. So that's what this chapter is all about. Understanding the relationship between judgment and kingdom. 
We also read at the end of verse 1, it says, For in these, in these plagues, is the end of the wrath of God. That's good news because it's going to bring about an end to his wrath. But understand that that is in this dispensation. We need and we'll see when we get later on in the book of Revelation after the millennial kingdom, there will be another outpouring of God's consuming judgment. Why? Well, what we've learned over and over, the kingdom of God is going to be established in two periods. First comes the millennial kingdom where Messiah will rule from the throne of God in the Holy of Holies between the two cherubim from the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that term, the Ark of the Covenant, because it's going to be very important in a few minutes. And then we're going to find that at the end of that millennial kingdom, Satan must be released. And in the end, he's going to be judged once more in those who foolishly join together with him. So over and over we see judgment in the kingdom, judgment in that final kingdom, the new Jerusalem that will have no end. So over and over we see this relationship. Move on in chapter 2, chapter 15 and verse 2. It says, I looked and a sea like a glass mixed with fire. Now we've talked about over the last few weeks the uniqueness of this term sea. We've talked about how a sea is usually always moving, waves are, are, are roaring and such. And we talked about the significance between a sea and instability. And we talked about how instability brought about the, the empire, that final evil empire that uh, was opposed to the purposes of God. But what I want you to see here is that although sea is used here, it's very different. It is not a sea of water, but it is a sea of glass mingled with fire. That is, fire was related to how this glass was produced. So it brought about a sea of stability. And notice what it says concerning those who are victorious. We read in verse, verse 2, I looked in a sea like glass, which was mixed with fire, and those who were victorious, victorious over the beast and over the image and over the mark and over the number of his name. What were they doing? They were standing on this, this sea of glass. What does that have to do with? It has to do with triumph. It has to do with overcoming. See, standing on the sea shows that you've overcome the instability and those things that gave rise to the empire, we have triumphed over them. And notice that they had the harps of God in their hand. What were they doing? Because of this triumph, the harps are synonymous with praising God, worshiping. So there was a change that was brought about. God brought an end to instability, those things that give rise to wickedness and evil. He brought stability, which is seen in truth. And what was the outcome of that? As we said, the worship of God. Move on now to verse 3. Now, this is going to be the third time that a song is mentioned. And we're looking at victory there's going to be, and don't miss this, there is a relationship between victory and judgment. And that's why those people who want to say, you know, God doesn't judge anymore. That's not the nature of the God of the New Testament. These individuals are sadly mistaken. We see, biblically speaking, there's a relationship between judgment and worship. Look now at verse 3. Those standing on that sea of glass, it says... And they sung a song. What song? Well, earlier we saw that it was a new song, and this is a new song. But notice how it's revealed in this passage. Learning about this new song, it says, It is a song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now, what is this to tell us? Something that the Bible has, has hinted to over and over in this passage. And that is, there is not a conflict between the teachings of Moses and the teachings of Messiah, the work, the salvation of Messiah. What we find is, it is the commandments that outline 
truth. It outlines holiness, that which is righteous, that which is pleasing to God. But it's only through the work of Messiah, that is lamb, what is lamb synonymous with? Redemption. That we can be put in a position where the truths, the commandments, the teachings of Moses can be realized in our life. And I want you to see there's numerous paradigms, not only in the book of Revelation, but several places in the scripture. If you look at the final prophet, the one who's called my servant, Malachi. And what does it say? Also known as Malachi in English. What do we know about him? The last thing that he says is to remember the law of Moses. And he says, get ready because redemption is coming. I'm going to send my servant Elijah, who's going to prepare the way. So understand, this is not something new. John is referring to what the scriptures clearly taught by means of the prophet. So they sung the song of Moses, the servant of God. And the song of the Lamb saying, Great are your works and marvelous, Lord God of hosts, for righteous and truth are true are your ways, O King of the saints. For who will not fear you, O Lord, and who will not honor, give honor to your name? And once again, this emphasis upon the name of God. What do we learn about this? It is synonymous with the character of God. So the character of God is reflected where? In the scripture. Well, if you were to ask any Orthodox rabbi, they would tell you that the character of God is manifested in the commandments of God. If you want to know how God would live if he became a man, he would be obedient to the law. And that's why the scripture emphasizes that Messiah, he never transgressed the law. He never sinned. So the character of God is seen in the character of Messiah Yeshua, who was one who fulfilled the law. And now this one by faith lives in me, lives in me through redemption. And he lives in you through that same means. So look again, it says, great and marvelous are your deeds, O Lord God of hosts, for righteous and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Here again, saints, that term refers to two biblical truths. Those who have been made holy. Understand this. There is an inherent relationship between justification and being made holy. It is by means of justification that I become declared holy before God. But understand the second outcome of holiness. Holiness is also seen in being set apart called for a purpose. So when he says the, the, the God of the saints, what he's talking about is that he's our God and we are supposed to live according to the purposes of God. Verse 4. Who will not fear you, O Lord, not honor your name? For holy are you alone. For all the nations they will come and they will worship before you. For your righteous judgments have been revealed. Now, what does it mean when it says all the nations are to come and they are going to worship you? Does that mean everyone's going to be saved? No, it does not. Remember what Paul reveals in the book of Philippians. He says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God. That what? What are they going to confess? That Yeshua HaMashiach, that is Messiah Yeshua, He is Lord. Now everyone's going to do that. But that does not mean everyone's going to be saved. Many people are going to be doing that in the point of judgment. That is this. They are going to be judged. They are going to be consumed with the reality of truth that He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. But, but confessing that after death has no merit to it. It's a fact. They are going to be required to do that because they are going to, to respond to God. But that doesn't mean they're going to be saved. But everyone is going to acknowledge who He is. Now, what I want you to see here, move on to verse 5. Verse 5 is going to reveal to us what I started this teaching and this lesson about, and that is the basis for understanding the judgment of God. 
What are the parameters? Why does God judge? What brings about his judgment? Well, look at what it says in verse 5. After finding out that he's holy, that he's righteous, that his judgment, his ways are true. Verse 5. After these things, I looked and behold, there was open up the, the sanctuary of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven. Now, look at this phrase, the tabernacle of of testimony. Whenever we talk about the term testimony in this context, we're talking about something that is very reminiscent, reflective of the Ark of the Covenant. It's also called the Ark of the Testimony. Understand that a synagogue is, is built and designed based upon the temple. That is not the temple here, but the temple in the heavens. And what do we know? That there was the, the tabernacle of testimony. It is reminiscent of the Ark of the Covenant. Let me ask you a question. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? Well, there's a couple different things, one of which were the commandments, the Ten Commandments, those tablets. And understand that there is a relationship between the Ten Commandments and all the commandments of, the, of God. What do I mean by this? Well, if you came from a Jewish background, you would know something that Judaism does in regard to the commandments. Remember when Messiah Yeshua he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, of course, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He also said, and your neighbor as yourself. So in Judaism, what can be done is to take those two commandments, put the one, love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor one under the other. And then what you can do under those two, you can write the Ten Commandments across. So altogether, that is, is a total of 12 commandments. How many remain? 601. And you can take every one of those remaining 601 commandments for a total of 613. You can take every one and put it under one of the Ten Commandments. So what I want you to see is that there is a connection, a relationship between Aseret Hadibrot, the Ten Commandments, and the Torah, in a general sense, all 613 commandments. So even though only the Ten Commandments, those two tablets, were in the Ark of the Covenant, what it refers to is all the commandments. So look again, and I want you to see the imagery that is being displayed here so that we have a right understanding of, of God's judgment. Look again at verse 15. And afterwards, I looked and behold, open up in the sanctuary, that is the sanctuary in heaven, the tabernacle of testimony in the heaven. And there went out from this sanctuary, notice, seven angels carrying these seven plagues. Now, these seven plagues are what we saw earlier, which contain the, the wrath of God. And what do we see? We see the connection between God's wrath, that is his judgment, and the commandments. He judges, the basis for his judgment is the violation of the commandments of God. And when people do not fulfill his righteousness. So that's the basis. If you're a believer, your failure to fulfill all those previous sins, all those present and future sins, they have been paid fully by the blood of Messiah. But if you have not received that gospel message, then you are going to be judged for every violation of the law of God. And that's what it's talking about in this passage. So look again. There went out from the sanctuary those seven angels carrying the seven uh, plagues. They were dressed in, in linen, which were, were pure and bright. And they were girded, that is, their chests were girded with, with, with golden bands. So here they have been prepared to do their work. Remember seven. Seven they have been sanctified for a purpose. Look now at verse seven. And one of the four creatures, remember there's four in the heavens that continually praise God. One of these four creatures, it was given by him to the seven angels that had these seven golden what? Well, we're talking about these seven plagues, but they were given seven golden bowls. And what we're going to find is, in the next chapter, each one of these seven angels, what do they do? They take one of these golden bowls, they have it, and at God's bequest, they pour it upon the earth. 
And what we're going to see is that these judgments are unique. These judgments could not be done by, by man. They are not a human outcome. They are clearly, clearly the work of a supernatural God. They, they overshadow anything that that, that, that false beast, that is that antichrist could do. Everyone is going to know that God is holy. What does that mean? That God judges sin. And here again, although these are wrath for the purpose of consumption, notice why he's consuming. It's not because God is a hateful God, that God delights in the death of individuals. No, it is because of an unworthiness of the people. An unwillingness would be a better way to put it, to repent and turn to sin. I think one of the most amazing things in the book of Revelation is how clearly and, and such in power, an undeniable power that God manifests himself to the world. And people are not willing to humble themselves, to give him honor, to, to confess their sins and turn away from those sins and embrace him. That's not what people do. They are going to remain in a blasphemous manner. That is to say this, the character of the beast, that final empire, is going to be demonstrated as their character as well. But, but look again, verse, verse 7. And one of the four beasts, it was given, he gave to the seven angels that had the seven golden bowls. And they were filled with the wrath of God, the one who lives forever and ever. Now, that expression, the God who lives forever and ever, is all about one thing. It talks about him being eternal. And eternal is, is, is referred to in the scripture as that which transcends all. And that's what it's saying here. It's the transcendent God. How do we think of that? We think about the God who was and is and shall, shall be. The one who is over all things. It's him that is judging. One of the ways that the scripture has referred to God in these chapters is the Lord God of hosts. And that term hosts, tzavot, is a military term. It's a term for armies. It's in the plural. So it is a supernatural God who comes in the mul multiplicity of armies to bring about his judgment. Move on to verse 8. We find here that the, the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God. Now, notice something. There is in this passage an inherent relationship between God's judgment, how is judgment being deferred, referred to here, God's wrath and His glory. Many people think these two things are incompatible, a wrathful God and a glorious God. Yes, indeed. It is because God is holy and, and, and glorious that he judges sin. And it's this judgment of that which is unholy that manifests his holiness into this world. So we see once more, verse 8. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and his power. Now, this is very, very similar. It is reminiscent to what we see going back to the book of, of, of Chronicles and also in Kings. What do we talk about there? Well, think about Solomon for a moment. When Solomon, when he built that first temple, he had to do something with it. And what was that? He had to dedicate it. And, and as the dedication went forth, Solomon prayed. And what happens? It was through the prayer that the, the temple, that first temple, filled up with smoke that was also connected to the glory of God. And because of that, none of the priests could go into the temple and work. What does that mean? It means that God did everything. Now, in this context, it is to be reminiscent of that, that the holiness of God is being manifested. But notice something else that's happening here. Look again at verse 8. And the smoke from the glory of God filled the temple. And, and with his power, it says, there was not able any man to enter into the sanctuary until the seven plagues were complete. Why is that? Here's the point. Nothing can be, listen, nothing can stop this judgment from coming. 
God is not going to change his mind. God is not going to repent. God forbid he doesn't repent. I realize the Bible uses that term sometime, but what it means is this. God was comforted. In English we say that, but it's not the normal word for repentance. It says that God was comforted and therefore he did not place his judgment. This is not going to be the situation here. We're going to find that nothing, this is what this text is saying, nothing can bring about an end or a stopping of this, this wrath until it is all poured out in its entirety. So it says, And no man could enter into the sanctuary until was finished the seven plagues which are in the hands of those seven angels. Notice something. Over and over, that number seven appears. See, there's a connection between the wrath of God and the manifestation of God's holiness. He is going to bring judgment so that all elements, every aspect of sin is consumed. So there's nothing left except for that which is in agreement with the plans, the purposes, and the will of God. One last thing that I want to say, and that is this. After God's judgment, you know what's going to be manifested? We're going to see later on in the book of Revelation, God's blessing. And that's why that he uses the term wine. Remember, wine, joy. Because the outcome of this wine of his wrath is going to be him pouring blessings. What is that? The fulfillment of his covenant promises to his people. See, we don't want to live in a world where there's those things that are in opposition to the purposes of God. He's going to consume those things so that only thing that re, 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 re lasts is the will of God. Well, I'm out of time. Until next week when we move on into Revelation and chapter 16. May God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>